Welcome to the final video for Unit 2 on topics 2.10 and 2.11, cell compartmentalization and origins of cell compartmentalization. Studying the scientific origin of life on Earth is no small task. The earliest evidence of life dates back at least 3.77 billion years ago and some evidence even suggests that the first life forms on Earth date back 4.3 billion years. In a later unit, we're going to explore the chemical origins of life, but this presentation will focus more on the origin of eukaryotic organisms. Before eukaryotes, prokaryotes were the only forms of life on Earth for a very long time. The planet was theirs for nearly 2 billion years, and they evolved to occupy nearly every ecological niche in existence. Our brains have real difficulty comprehending such large numbers in relation to these vast expanses of time. Because of the perspective that our relatively short lifespans provide, our appreciation of time periods is limited to decades and centuries, and maybe even a millennium or two. But millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or billions of years is quite simply unfathomable. Here's some food for thought. A million seconds is about 11 and a half days. But a billion seconds with three more zeros? That's nearly 32 years. Why this is important to note is because it always must be kept in mind that the evolution of life from simple to complex has taken place over such a long, incomprehensible period of time. One of the most important evolutionary developments that made possible complex multicellular eukaryotic life is the compartmentalization within cells. On the largest scale within a cell, there are three main compartmental regions that can be identified. The first is the nucleus and endomembrane system. This region includes the nucleus, nucleolus, and the rest of the nuclear contents, as well as the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticula. The second region includes all of the remaining organelles, such as the Golgi apparatus, mitochondria and chloroplasts, vacuoles and vesicles, lysosomes, and more. Those previous two regions are suspended in an aqueous solution that comprises the third region, the cytosol. Within the cytosol is a wide variety of solutes, all participating in various biochemical reactions that contribute to the sustainment of the cell's life. Establishing barriers between regions within a cell and compartmentalizing those regions provides a number of benefits that include the isolation of chemical reactants involved in different metabolic pathways, the enzymes, proteins, and reactants, and products associated with photosynthesis can be found in the chloroplast, those involved with the Krebs cycle, a stage in cellular respiration, are present in the mitochondrial matrix. Starches, used to store carbohydrates in plants, are found in a plant cell's central vacuole. A second benefit of compartmentalization is the establishment of specific environments required for certain types of reactions to occur. For example, while the pH of the cytosol is between 7.2 and 7.4, Many of the reactions that take place within lysosomes do so in an acidic environment with a pH between 4.5 and 5.0. A third benefit of compartmentalization has to do with how organelles that have related or connected functions are in proximity to one another. The membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with that of the nucleus. This is beneficial in increasing the efficiency of protein synthesis. Membrane-bound organelles acquire raw materials and expel wastes in the same way as the cell as a whole does. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and osmosis. As an extension of the compartmentalization of internal functions within cells, in multicellular organisms there has evolved the presence of specialized cells that carry out a specific related set of tasks. Groups of cells with a similar structure and physiology are referred to as tissues. Examples of tissues include epithelial tissue, 
which has functions including providing a covering for internal and external surfaces, as well as being an important in the secretion of fluids. Examples of epithelial tissue in animals are numerous and include skin and scales, and secrete fluids like saliva and stomach acid. Muscle tissue is exclusive to animals. Skeletal muscle is under the voluntary control of the animal, whereas the smooth and cardiac muscle are involuntary and found lining the digestive system and the heart, respectively. Nervous tissue is also unique to animals and has the responsibility of detecting and responding to both internal and external stimuli. An animal's connective tissue is important in constructing bones and tendons and ligaments. Plants have a few tissue types that are unique to them, ground, dermal, and vascular, which all have different sets of functions to accomplish. The same is true for multicellular fungi, which possess five different tissue types. The serial endosymbiosis theory, or SET, is the prevailing scientific theory that outlines the origin of eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic organisms. SET was first proposed in the early 1900s, but was truly advanced and supported by microbiological evidence in the 1960s by Dr. Lynn Margulis. Widely recognized as one of the most important scientists of the modern era, she proposed the mechanisms by which prokaryotic cells could come to form eukaryotic cells. Her work was instrumental in providing the evidence that supports this scientific theory. The S, or serial, in SET tells us that the events involved in the formation of eukaryotic cells occurred in a specific sequence. The sequence begins with the premise that prokaryotic life would have existed first. As early prokaryotic cells expanded in size, taking advantage of more and more raw materials from their environment, infoldings of the cell membrane would provide for a greater surface area to volume ratio. Having a greater surface area in contact with the environment would have provided a benefit and advantage to those cells as they could exchange materials with their environment more efficiently. The second component of SET states that those infoldings of the membrane would have pinched off and become separated from the cell membrane itself. That would give rise to the endomembrane system, forming the nucleus and other associated organelles. Having a separate protected location in which a cell could store its genetic information would surely have been advantageous. The next two steps of SET focus in on the origins of two organelles in particular, the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. The origin of the mitochondrion begins when a smaller, oxygen-utilizing prokaryote is engulfed by a larger cell, perhaps as prey, but ends up avoiding digestion by that larger cell. This newly formed relationship would be beneficial for both organisms, as the larger host cell can take advantage of energy-rich molecules being produced by the aerobic prokaryote, and the smaller symbiont has the benefit of a stable, protected environment with plenty of raw materials to utilize. This newly formed cell is representative of the ancestors to animal and fungal cells, as well as other heterotrophic organisms. The final step of SET explains the origin of chloroplasts. Like before, it all begins with an endocytic event in which a smaller cell is engulfed by a larger one. This time, however, the smaller cell being engulfed is photosynthetic, perhaps like the currently existing cyanobacteria. Similar to the origin of the mitochondrion, this symbiotic relationship would have provided a benefit to both the larger host cell and the smaller symbiont cell. This union resulted in the ancestors to algae and plant cells. The illustration shown here outlines those steps of SET. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like more time to study it. As with any scientific theory, SET is supported by a wide variety of empirical evidence. 
It's important to make this point to avoid any misconception about the validity and factuality of scientific theories. Since we've already studied the benefits conferred by increased surface area and those that accompany compartmentalization of eukaryotic cells, let's focus on the evidence that support the prokaryotic origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both replicate by a process called binary fission, the same process used by prokaryotes to reproduce. Unlike the linear chromosomes found within eukaryotic nuclei, mitochondria and chloroplasts possess their own circular DNA, just like prokaryotes. Transport proteins called porins are found in the cell membranes of prokaryotes and in the outer membranes of chloroplasts and mitochondria. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells contain ribosomes for the construction of polypeptides. They differ only in that prokaryotic ribosomes are slightly smaller than those in eukaryotes. The ribosomes in chloroplasts and mitochondria, they're like those in prokaryotic cells. All polypeptide construction in eukaryotic cells begins with the same amino acid, methionine. But in prokaryotic cells, a special version of methionine, called n formyl methionine, is used, just like chloroplasts and mitochondria. If chloroplasts or mitochondria are removed from a eukaryotic cell, the cell has no mechanisms by which to replace them, suggesting their free-living origins. And both chloroplasts and mitochondria have a double phospholipid bilayer. The presence of two membranes is evidence of endocytosis. In this model, we see a larger blue cell preparing to engulf a smaller orange one. The blue cell begins to extend its cell membrane out and around the orange one. Eventually, the two extensions of the blue cell's membrane meet, fuse together, and pinch off. The smaller orange cell, now inside the larger one, possesses its original phospholipid bilayer as well as the one from the larger cell as it was engulfed. This brings our look at these two topics as well as unit two to a close. Thanks for watching and until the next unit, take care.